thank you for that nice introduction, Oscar. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about entity disambiguation. Okay, so you've come here and you've enjoyed the pizza and the beer, um, but you don't really know what Brand Watch does, or well, some of you do, because you work here. Um, so let's start by finding out about that. So what does Brand Watch do? Um, what we do is we monitor social media. So every public post that you make on Twitter and TikTok and Reddit and all of that, we collect and download and analyze. And um, we then create these because there are a lot of people talking on social media, right? And if you were to read them all individually, not only would it take all day, much longer than all day, and you'd get very depressed, um, so instead, you look at nice graphs and pie charts and um, word clouds and stuff like that. And that tells you everything you need to know about social media. Um, so in order to work with this, though, you have to be quite specific about what you want, because there's so much stuff, just like I said. And so you write a query like this. It's lovely, isn't it? It's really easy to understand. And um, if you're familiar at all with programming, you might notice things like or and 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 not. And so you're basically saying what has to be there and what shouldn't be there and stuff like that. All right. And it's really easy. And I'm sure you could all do it. And so we do, like I've got to emphasize, we've got a lot of data. We've got over a petabyte of data, if you want numbers, and trillions of posts. And so you really do have to be quite specific about what you want. Otherwise, you're going to be overwhelmed, even with those fancy graphs. And so now comes the live demo. The bit that you know always goes wrong, and here is a picture of a demo going wrong. And I got a funny story for you, right? There was a uh, client demo that was done recently in this company, and someone broke the platform while it was happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not going to be doing a live demo. Um, instead, I've taken lots of screenshots, and we're going to go through them as if we were doing a live demo. All right, how about that? I know, right? You're all so disappointed. But what we're going to do is we're going to find out about Apple, the fruit, not the company, the fruit. OK, and so I've just logged in, says, hello, welcome, Matthew. And I'm in the project Matthew Franklin because I'm very unoriginal with my names. And so let's go. I'm going to set up my data. And this is using the same sort of query that you just saw. And so I open that up. I have to create a query. And then I have to enter the query. And then I've got this box in front of me. And so I type the simplest thing in. OK, Apple, let's go with that. And um, then I preview it. OK, 800, uh, no, 8 million mentions in the last 30 days. And we can have a quick look at them. This one's got CSS that has the Apple word in it. And that's not very good. Um, this one's talking about Apple's got a billion paying subscribers. I mean, that's good for them, but it's not what I want. Um, so we need to work on this a little bit, okay? And so we then also look at this sort of aggregation. This is the sort of thing you'd be looking at in a dashboard. So this is a word cloud of the different topics. And we can see like Apple Music and Spotify and so on. But there is a little bit about the actual Apple that I'm interested in, like Apple Pie and Cider and stuff like that. But if you've used these at all before, you know that the size of the thing the size of the word relates to how common it is. And so you can see that they're really very rare in this data set. So we got to work on it and we add in an exclusion. So no computers or phones or subscribers, thank you very much. And then we have a look at it and we can see just below um, that we're talking about like flowers and juice and stuff like that, looking pretty good. So then we can look at the word cloud again, and it's looking much more encouraging. Pretty good. That was easy. Um, and then we look at the top authors. And we've got a weird one, subreddit summary bot. OK, this isn't looking good. And we go and look at it, and it's all Spotify. Every single thing is Spotify. And it's some sort of like music recommender, I don't know. Um, anyway. So we come along, we want to get rid of that. So we'd say, no more Spotify, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, and we, if you just look there, you can see that the bot's no longer there. Instead, Anonymous has made it in the first place. Congratulations, Anonymous. <laughs> um, yeah, so now we can start looking through the authors again. 
Those are looking fine. Anonymous apparently likes pescatarianism. Okay, fine. Um, I love photos, likes apples. Jolly good. Uh, Alison, also is a fan of fruit juice. Very good. Um, no, no. <laughs> now we have weed, which is apparently called sour green apple. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, so, yeah, we can continue. Okay. And one thing I should say is after the first bit of um, exclusions, you can't really see it very clearly, but it dropped down to 200,000 mentions from 8 million. So that initial set of exclusions excluded a lot of stuff. And there might have been stuff that we were interested in. So we really need a better way of doing this. Yeah. And is the better way really this? Like, this is what people are actually employed to do, to write these queries of, of doom that will actually capture what you want and less of what you don't want, you know? And the query editor that, um, that is available, I think it can handle 400,000 characters. So you can really go nuts with this. <laughs> it's wild. Wild. Um, so, yeah, how about the easy way? the easy way. Look, look. It's, you can barely see it, but it says AI powered. How about that? That's pretty cool, isn't it? AI is so hot right now. Um, so we type in apple and look, apple, fruit of the apple tree. Oh my God, this is looking good. And I click on that and I get to this screen, which is what I really wanted after all, all of those lovely graphs. And it's not only that, it's found 700,000 mentions instead of 200,000. And so how about we look at some of those mentions? Well, here we go. I look at the mentions and I found this one on like the first bit. I didn't scroll this at the time. Um, apple Inc. was named by Steve Jobs after returning from an apple farm. So that would have been excluded by my previous query. How about that? So that is entity disambiguation. Thank you for coming to my talk. <laughs> Uh, no, not really. Uh, so what is entity disambiguation? Um, so we've got to work out what things people are talking about are. Yeah. So here we've got two sentences and they both have apple in them. And we've got to work out what apple actually is. So here we've got a nice definition uh, from Papers with Code. If you want to check out different areas of data science, you could go and check that out. It's a very interesting site. And they say that entity disambiguation is the task of linking mentions of ambiguous entities to their reference entities in a knowledge base such as Wikipedia. I actually think that's a really good um, description, except it uses entities too much. Um, so other companies have this problem as well. So here is an existing system that you can download and use. Um, you know, it's one of the deep learning models. It's called Facebook Genre. Now, um, what it does is it takes in text and then it writes it out again in a sort of markdown style where it brackets the different words or phrases that could refer to things and then adds in their Wikipedia title afterwards. Okay, that's all it does. And then you can like take that and recognize the entities that it's matched and so on. So um, other people have got this problem, even large companies, and we've had a crack at it too. Um, and so how do we define entities? We do also use Wikipedia. Um, I don't know if you know this, but there's a second site called Wikidata, which is more comprehensive than Wikipedia, and it's language neutral or language agnostic. And so we use the QIDs, this Q thing, I'm pointing at the screen, which you can't see. So I'll point over here where the Zoom people can't see. Um, the Q thing, which then uniquely identifies each entity, because obviously this has got Apple as its title, and it may surprise you to know that Apple, the company, also has Apple as the title. Um, so yeah, we identify them by the QID. And, you know, I've been working on this for quite a while. I'm prone to slipping into using terms, which I haven't defined. Um, so now I'm going to define them for you. You're welcome. <laughs> so the surface, yeah, instead of saying that everything is an entity, when you talk about something in text or using words, you are using the surface form of the entity, okay? So you can sort of think of it as 
the wrapping around the box and it's got different sides for different words, but the thing inside the box is the same thing. Yeah. And then the entity is the thing that's inside the box. I'm going to use that to refer to the Wiki, Wiki data QID identified thing. Okay. And then entity disambiguation is the process of linking those two things together. All right. <clears throat> so just as a reminder, why do we need it? Well, I dragged you through creating that query, and I think we can all remember that pain. Um, so yeah, it lets people search for things instead of words. And I think that's really a very important um, thing to bear in mind. So at this point, we've made it through all of the introductions. We can actually get on with like, how does it work? How does it really work? Which is what you're here for. So this is a lovely um, architecture diagram of the whole system. And we've got surface extraction, which is identifying the words or phrases. Yeah. And then some mysterious stuff called fingerprint generation and entity matching, which themselves form entity disambiguation. You stick documents in one side and you get documents with entities out of the other side. Easy. And so let's imagine sticking this document through the entity disambiguation pipeline. So we just start with this text and we've got no idea what they're talking about. And the surface extraction stage identifies words or phrases in this that could be entities. And so we've got Friday and song, which is looking good. And then we disambiguate the entities. So we've identified Friday as being the Rebecca Black video, and we've identified song as being nothing. Now, we have to remember that this is a product for clients, and so we are interested in what they are interested in. So we could try and disambiguate everything, but that might be too much. It might make us less accurate than if we just focus our efforts on what clients actually want. And so here, like Friday is sort of a brand, I guess, um, a singer and so on. And people might conceivably search for that, but searching for all songs ever, probably not. Um, you know, and it's also when you're composing different models together, you should think about the error case. What happens if the first thing produces something which is a mistake? And so if this was to identify like favorite as a surface, we want it to compound that error by then having to identify an entity for that. Um, so let's try and dig into this a little bit further. How does surface extraction work? Well, it, what it does is it comes along and it looks at each word and identifies the part of speech tag for that word. And then we've got a set of rules, much like those queries that you just saw, that identify all of the phrases that could be um, entities. And we combine the two together and everything that matches is a surface. And sometimes you can have overlapping surfaces and then the longest one wins. So Statue and Statue of Liberty. Obviously those that overlap, we're interested in Statue of Liberty. So then we've got this idea of entity disambiguation. And I did talk about fingerprints. And the idea here is that we've pre-calculated a bunch of fingerprints, which we can think of as a list of words at this point. And we then take the surface that we're interested in and work out what words best describe that. And then the greatest overlap between the fingerprints and the word wins. So you can see here that we've got Rebecca Black's song or Good Friday. And the song is like song and video and so on and so on. And Good Friday is about a book and death. And um, when we look at this context, unsurprisingly, the fingerprint is song. And so it matches more to the uh, Rebecca Black video, luckily. Um, so yeah. So the next thing is, how do we actually get these words out? Now, ChatGPT is so hot right now, 
And um, I think it would be remiss of me not to include a chat GPT slide in this presentation. And so you've all used it probably, and you know about prompting it in order to get it to do things that you want. We sort of do the same thing, but with a smaller model. We instruct the model to tell us about the word or surface of interest. And I should point out at this point that this is like a real tweet that actually exists from 2020, way before ChatGPT. And so people have been doing this prompting stuff for ages with much smaller models. Okay. And so here is how we prompt it. This isn't actually the top secret prompt. Yeah, I've substituted it for a different one, but it's much the same. Um, so we take Friday is my favorite song as the context, and then we have a prompt of Friday is a. And if we imagine doing sort of Mad Lib style, we're trying to produce the next word. And if you were going to do that, you'd say something like song or video or, you know, terrible or something like that. <clears throat> and um, depending on your opinion, um, and that would form the surface fingerprint. So the language model doesn't just predict one word, it predicts all of the words and it assigns them like a confidence level. We can take the top, uh, the most confident words out, and they can form this fingerprint that I'm talking about. Okay, so this is the entity disambiguation pipeline. We've been through surface extraction and fingerprint generation and entity matching. And hopefully all of that makes a bit more sense now. And so, how does it really work? Like if I asked you now, there's a sort of workshop test to go and implement that, would you be able to? Like, yeah, no, maybe. Um, you probably could. <laughs> um, let's have a look. So it uses the PyTorch framework. Uh, you probably heard of that if you've done anything in deep learning. And um, these graphs are here to show you that PyTorch has basically taken over the deep learning space. So. In the top graph, we've got the proportion of TensorFlow to PyTorch in academic papers. And you can see PyTorch's rapid growth. And that one, unfortunately, only goes up to 2021. But the bottom one goes to 2023. And that one shows the proportion of repositories by their framework. OK, and you can see that um, TensorFlow has unfortunately continued its decline. Uh, but that's fine. I, li I like PyTorch. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, PyTorch, yay. And it uses Hugging Face. You should definitely use Hugging Face if you're doing natural language processing. It's really, really good. Um, and you know, this this presentation obviously is going to be filled with my opinions, but I hope they have bear some resemblance to the truth. Um, so yeah. And it uses the transformer model which is like the hotness and it's not even the current hotness. It's been the hotness for a while. Um, and it, those were introduced in the attention is all you need paper. And I'm going to have like links here. Um, another reason to join the Slack is that I'll post this, uh, set of slides onto there so that you can go and check out these papers. Okay. And, um, if you're at all familiar with like history, maybe you did deep learning at university or anything, you might've gone over, um, recurrent neural networks and long short-term memory and that kind of thing. Now, I can give you a tiny introduction to transformers compared to them. And that is, if you think about these sort of recursive approaches, the problem here is that they process the text one word at a time, and they pass a context along at each step. And what this means is that information at the start of the sentence has to pass through every single word until it reaches the end of the sentence. So two things that are quite separate are very difficult to connect because at each step, it has the chance of losing that information. And it also makes it very difficult to run it fast because in order to generate the context at each step, you have to process all of the words previously. And so you can't parallelize it very effectively. Okay, um, so instead, transformers operate over the entire input all at once and they fundamentally just multiply it by itself. Now, matrix multiplication isn't learnable, and deep learning is all about learning things. 
And so they have like a simple transformation over the input at each stage that splits it up into, they call it query key and value, but basically three different inputs. Okay. Um, so like I was saying, transformers aren't even the current hotness. They've been hot for a while and it all started with BERT. And um, every um, state of the art NLP model has been a transformers model since then. And a lot of them have really silly names. So yeah. Um, so let's go over a little bit of example code, because I know that you all love that. <clears throat> you know, you're hopefully going to learn how to do entity disambiguation. And Hugging Face does make it really, really easy to use these models. So this is a complete set of code that you could run in order to do sentiment analysis. How about that? Okay. And we can then go over prompting. Now, this is a bunch more code, but this is actual working code. And remember, I'm going to share these slides. And what it does is it takes the I love utterance, which I've um, highlighted at the top, and then it gets the predictions out of it for the next word. And then we can see them at the bottom. So it's like, I love you. I love it. I love this. That kind of thing. OK. And these are the most likely continuations. And this is the way in which we generate the fingerprint. And this is for causal language models, which predict the next word. OK. And there's another kind of um, language model which predicts the masked word. And so here I've changed the input to I love mask, exclamation mark. And now it knows that it's got to fill in that blank. And that's the end of the sentence because of the exclamation mark. And so instead of saying things like I love the, which would need more words to complete it, it's now got complete utterances. So I love Halloween, apparently. Um, but, you know, it's pretty good. I don't know if that would be my top five. Um, but yeah, here we are. And if we think again of ChatGPT, then ChatGPT prompts are very, very different. When you prompt ChatGPT, you give it a long form instruction and then a bunch of context. And then you wait for it to generate like a paragraph or two, if you're lucky, if it's being like quite concise um, of output that tells you like what it's thinking and everything about that. OK, now the problem is, is that each of those words is one invocation of the model. OK. I say words, I mean tokens, which can be even subwords. So in order to um, run this, which was, yeah, tell me how to write a good prompt for a conversational model. Like uh, you can tell what I was thinking about. Um, it actually produced like more than 200 tokens, so 200 invocations of that model. And if we're thinking in terms of like a company that wants to run this in production, that's going to be really expensive. And it gets even worse, though, because if you were trying to classify documents using this long form output, you might need to feed the output into another model in order to work out what it actually means. So yeah, um, chat GPT prompts are very different, and they're for a very different task. So here is the actual example that I gave you at the beginning. Friday is my favorite song. Friday is a song. Yeah. OK, and this is using causal language modeling. So yeah, now you know the secret source. <laughs> um, so now we can talk about putting it in the website. And um, we have to process 350 million documents every day. This is running over every English document that we receive. And so that's quite a lot. <clears throat> um, we need to match them to client queries. We need to aggregate them in various ways. We need to run many sorts of analysis, not just entity disambiguation over them. And so we've got to be able to run this cheaply. It's very important. And so here, another one of my architecture diagrams. I should, you know, become an architect. Um, now, the important part here is that you can see the resource pipeline at the beginning that starts with data providers, goes through magic. Very important technical term that, um, and ends in storage. And then we have like 
the mention pipeline, which goes from storage to more magic, and then goes into query storage. And then you have like my lovely photorealistic rendition of a happy client. <laughs> yeah, and the squiggly lines. Yeah, it's great. So let's go over the resource pipeline. All right. So we'd start with our data providers. We want to go and get all of these uh, mentions of social media. Sometimes uh, um, companies like Twitter actually provide an API for us to use. And other times we actually buy it from a third party aggregator. But we need crawlers to go and collect all of that data. And then we've got this enrichment stage where we can analyze it in ways that are universally applicable. And finally, we stick it into our storage system. And so if we're to break this down a little bit, we might have language detection, sentiment, and entity disambiguation as part of our enrichment. And we've got to think that this stage, it's got to be stuff that really is universally applicable because this is going to be seen by everyone. Now, it doesn't matter if you're Unilever or if you're Coca-Cola, the thing that a document is talking about is not going to change. And so that's why entity disambiguation is appropriate at this stage. Equally, the language of a document is not going to change. But if you want to do stuff related to your specific query, then that would change depending on which client you are. Okay, so that's why we've got the split. And so now we've got like what actually gets stored in these Lucene indices. And it goes over again, like it has to be universally applicable. Um, but it's one copy of every document that we've seen. And the idea here is that we can look at this at any point and find everything that we've ever seen, which is pretty neat. And so I really cut this down because you can barely see it, but this is like an an already truncated version of something that has been stored. And so you can see like you've got contents and author details and sentiment and disambiguated entities and so on and so on. Um, and then once again, we get to look at this lovely query because the clients are interested in this data, but not in all of it because there's too much of it. And so they have to query it. And so the querying is why we have the mention pipeline, okay? because they can't query this huge database directly. It'll be much too slow, especially if they're gonna do aggregations over that. And so here, I've once again broken down the magic that happens. I'm sorry to dispel all of that, um, but here we are. So we start with the Lucene indices. We have matches that determine if each document matches your query. And then again, we've got alterations and you can actually see that this quite matches, uh, it's quite similar to the previous pipeline that you saw. And that's pretty neat. <clears throat> Makes it easy for me to explain. So you can see that you've got like rules and categories and various manual changes that people have made to the documents in their query. And then once again, it gets stored in Lucene for their query, and then they can query it really quickly. And I've said query way too many times now. Um, so yeah. What gets stored this time? It's every document that matches the query. And that makes it really fast for the client to be able to see all of these dashboards and aggregations and things like that. And here we get another promotional photo of the uh, front end. You can see some line charts and stuff. It's really nice. Um, yeah, and it's important to realize that with so much data, if they were directly querying the main database, it would be much too slow just to make their initial request, much less to aggregate it in various ways. Um, and so that's the document processing pipeline, a little bit less magical, perhaps, but you know, it's still there. We've gone over the resources and the mentions, very nice. Um, okay, so like I said, we've got to do all this really, really fast because time is money, very literally. You have to pay for Amazon servers, depending on how long they're running. Um, so 350 million documents, we have to annotate them really quickly. And so I'm gonna talk about like the actual deep learning models that we're um, using. So Llama was recently leaked and we can talk about that as a sort of comparative analysis of 
things like model size and speed and how what you can do in order to speed them up, okay? Um, so it is supposed to be similar in quality to ChatGPT. I'm sure that some of you have used it and you'll find that it's a little bit worse maybe, um, but it is out there. And so we can download it and try it out. And these are the sizes of the four different ones that you can get. And so the 7 billion one needs 28 gigs of GPU RAM and the 65 billion one needs 260. It's easy, right? Um, now, the problem is, is that um, you won't be able to buy a graphics card for your like gaming rig that has more than 24 gigabytes. So you can't run any of them. Congratulations. <laughs> and the largest one actually requires the largest machine in AWS in order to run it. Yeah. Uh, the P4D 24X large, which has 320 gigabytes in graphics card memory. Okay. And that's like $32 an hour. So yeah, good luck with that. <clears throat> um, so maybe we don't need the full precision model. Maybe we can cut things down. So the reason, if we go back, you can see that this seven turns into 28, like it's using four bytes for every parameter. And that gives it like lots of precision, but maybe it doesn't need so much. Maybe we can just use two bytes. And that's what the half in this refers to. We cut each of those parameters in half, throw away the half we don't care about, and then we save like half the memory. And now suddenly that 7 billion um, model will fit on your fancy gaming card, okay? Um, the funny thing about doing this though is that a lot of operations inside these deep learning models don't need four bytes of accuracy they can actually be done using the two byte precision and they can be done faster without loss of precision. So there's actually a mode called automatic mixed precision that you can use to make your model faster. And um, if you use that, it won't save memory, but you can also cut your memory size in half as well and not lose that much. Okay, so pretty good. But then you can go to quantization. Okay, and now you're taking those four bytes and making it into one byte. And at this point, it's called quantization because it moves from being like a real number into an integer. Okay, and more than that, though, the quantization currently is more like buckets. You have values on the real line and you create buckets for them of varying sizes and each one has a number, and those are what get stored in the integer, you know, 0 to 255, okay? And that turns out to be enough to do these sort of computations, but you do lose accuracy in your output. You start to really experience the cost of this kind of quantization. Um, and that results in the model producing different predictions given the same input and you compare it to like the full fat model, okay? And you can even take it further than that. You can take it down to four bit and three bit. And to put that into context, yeah, one byte is eight bits. And so three bits, that's eight values. Yeah, so each parameter now can have eight distinct values. And what this does though, is it takes that seven billion model and turns it into 3.9 gigabytes. Now I got a really old crappy phone from 2017. This number is not a guess, this is my phone. Um, and it's got four gigs of memory. So in theory, it could run the 7 billion model. Okay, so how about that, All right? Now it gets crazier because the very largest language models, someone was talking to me earlier about Bloom. I believe that this is Bloom. Um, quantization performance. And you can see as you get towards the hundreds of billions of parameters, you can um, cut out half of all of the weights and quantize it to four bit with almost no difference in output. But if you use like a more reasonable size model, then it absolutely destroys your model. Sorry about that. So yeah. Um, and this turns out to be quite important for us because we're dealing with a very subtle difference in producing these fingerprints. 
you know, it needs to distinguish between different meanings of the word to quite a high precision. And so we weren't able to use quantization and all of these reductions. But if we go back, we can see that models often come in multiple sizes. And so we chose a smaller model and that was able to get us our speed up. So, you know, a bit of bait and switch here, I guess, but you know, you have to balance accuracy versus speed. And there are many different ways that you can make something faster at the cost of your accuracy. And it really comes down to what you're trying to do with it. So the kind of quantization approach might work really well if you're using um, a really large model for a conversational interface. But for us, it was just too much to lose. Okay, so we've just gone over how we can process 350 million documents a day. And we can do this using all of these techniques and the processes that I've outlined to you for $200 a day. So really very cost effective. And in conclusion, now you know what entity disambiguation is and what brand watch is. One way you can do it using language model prompting, um, how you can prompt a language model, and some ways to make a language model more efficient. <laughs>